right, I'd like to welcome to episode five of Home Visit, my special guest this week, my good friend, the athletic director of Texas A&M, Ross Bjork. Ross, how are we doing today, brother? <clears throat> Tyler, I'm doing great. We're here at Texas A&M, we say howdy. Howdy. So howdy, howdy to you, and it's uh, it's great to see you uh, on this virtual setting. It's been a, it's been a while. It's but, been a uh, while. Thanks for having me on. You know, the only thing that's really changed is I see your hairline seems to be in the same place. Mine has disappeared. I have taken mine off, so that's, that's about what's you, changed. You have. I'm, I'm trying I to keep in. as much as I can. I gave in. All right, so we're going to start with this deal. You know, home visit, we like to get to know everybody on a little different level. You know, this is something I actually did not know about you, and it, it fired me up because <laughs> I got some unique stories about this place. You were born and from Dodge City, Kansas. and. That's right. The, and I and I'm one day when I write a book, it's gonna be it's gonna have a whole chapter in my book. I had this crazy recruiting trip to Kansas JUCOs like ten years ago, and I woke up in Dodge City, Kansas, and the temperature was minus eleven, with a minus thirty three degree wind chill. And I, I've never that's the coldest I've ever been in my life. And I what's the like you live there? What's the coldest that you can remember growing up? Yeah, you know, uh, get get the hell out of Dodge. Uh, that's that's what I did. Uh, lo love growing up there. It's a great place. My parents actually uh, still live there. They've been there since 1970, and uh, it, it was so fun growing up. But the thing about Dodge City, being in Western Kansas, you get all these fronts from Colorado that just roll through, and literally it can be. So the coldest that I remember, I remember in high school. And it was like minus five degrees. The wind chill was like in that minus 30, 40 degree because the wind blows. The Dodge City, people think Chicago is the windy city. Dodge City has the, the highest average wind speed on a daily basis of any city in the United States. It so used to be that way. We, people can look that up. So it's so, not good for your golf game, I take it. It's not good. You got to you got to shoot low. You got to keep it. Keep it low. Uh, but I but I remember going to high school and literally you drove up and all these like custodial workers basically had like blow torches because they were trying to keep the pipes from freezing. And they're walking around the hallways going to all these different sections of the high school because it was like minus 30 degree uh, wind chill. So uh, probably very similar to that day that you woke up in, in Dodge City. And then the next day or even that afternoon, it could be 70 degrees. And oh. uh, it's just it's just crazy weather patterns out there in western Kansas. That whole trip for me was like the Twilight Zone. Um, a lot of, I mean, we could go on for days about yep. that story, but the craziest part about that day was I went to go get gas when I left, and I was I was miserable because I looked at the advanced forecast. It was supposed to be in like <clears> the 30s or 40s, so I'd taken like a light jacket. Well, it wasn't. Um, I go in and pump gas. I was in pain pumping gas, and then I went and got a cup of coffee at the gas station and was going. I was going uh, to Dodge City Junior, Junior College to go recruit. Yep. And I was as I had probably about 150 to 200 yards to walk from mm. the car to the office. And when I got out, when I got to the office, my, my coffee was frozen. My coffee was, <laughs> yeah, my coffee was, it was, there was ice at the top of my coffee. I was like, this yeah. is crazy. So I didn't get a cup of coffee. Yeah. And then to add on to the Twilight Zone, I was literally sitting in the office with the head coach, and we were talking about a receiver. And his fo office phone rang, and he answered. He said, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll be there in just a minute. He hung up the phone and says, Coach, got to go. Got to go. Got fired. So just got fired. Just got fired. So he had to go to the president. And I was like, awesome. So yeah. all right, tell me a yeah. little bit. You, tell, you told me a story. We were talking about cold weather once upon a time. Tell me the story about you, and I think it was your mentor, or who, but about sitting on top of the press box yeah. in your yeah. game, freezing to death. Yeah. Yeah. So when I, when I worked at the University of Missouri from uh, 1997 to 2003, the athletic director that was there for five years during that stretch was a guy named Mike Alden. And uh, during games, Mike was was on edge. I mean, stressful, like just on edge. And he would always tell us, hey, once the ball kicks off, we, we can't control things. But yet he was super stressful during the game. And so they'd always give the visiting team like a like a box, like a, a booth or a suite. Sometimes they're really nice. Sometimes I remember the worst one is Arkansas State. We can talk about that later. But but they'd give you a booth, and we'd get there in the first quarter, and then all of a sudden he'd start pacing, and he would say, hey, look, we got to find a spot to go on the roof. Like, we got to get a spot where I can, like, 
get away from everybody and just kind of de-stress. So Iowa State, Ames, Iowa, it's like November. It's probably 1999 or, or 2000, and things were not going good for our team. And I remember being on that, and we had like no jackets because we thought, hey, we're going to sit inside. But no, we went on the roof. The wind's blowing. It's like ice and pellets, and like we're up there, and it's like, what are we doing up here? Because <laughs> you couldn't really move. You couldn't really like de-stress. You couldn't really pace, right? Because it was so windy, so cold. We had no jackets. And I remember after the game, like we had icicles hanging from our nose and our eyes, and it was it was just crazy. And then what's so funny is uh, when when I went to Ole Miss in 2013, we played Missouri. Mike Alden's the AD. The game is about 15 degrees. It is freezing cold. This was 2013. And Mike wanted to find a spot on the press box roof there at Ole Miss. And sure enough, we got him up there. We got two chairs up there. Same thing. He's freezing. He's got icicles hanging down, had no jacket. And I'm like, man, things haven't changed. So <laughs> those are those are the, the, the cold uh, press box uh, stress relieving uh, moments courtesy of Mike Alden. He could have survived in Dodge City for sure. It sounds like he uh, could have. I, I don't. I don't. I don't do. I don't do cold weather very well. So more uh, hats off to him there. All right. right. So what is you know now that recently with you know your good friend Travis Goff getting the Kansas job, what's what's in the water at Dodge City that we're producing these Power Five ads? <laughs> somebody, uh, somebody, t- a friend of mine tweeted at us and said, uh, "Boy, the criteria for athletic directors should now include uh, being from Dodge City." So. Hey. No, no I, th- I, I think uh, Travis is a great guy. He, uh, he He's younger than me, and so I, I knew him a little bit. I knew his family really well, uh, but knew him a little bit uh, growing up. Uh, I think I even umpired some of his baseball games uh, along the way. You know what? I, I think, honestly, I think Kansas people, back, back to kind of what you're talking about, the weather, the elements, the environment, I think we just kind of grow up sort of tough-minded. Right. Hard work is, is at the core. Uh, communication, communicating, being in a diverse environment. Dodge City is kind of a melting pot. I mean, there's Hispanics, blacks, whites. I mean, one of my best friends, uh, his family came from Vietnam. And so you learn to kind of work in a diverse environment. So I think uh, I think those are the attributes that Travis and I both have and uh, really happy for him and proud to, that he's at Kansas. I know. It's, 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 uh, yeah, it's cool. All right, so you know, one of my all I got I'm not gonna tell you which one it is, okay? But since you since you grew up on Dodge City, I'm a big movie guy, right? So two of my, you know, so we got Tombstone and mm-hmm. Wild Earth came out right on top of each other, right? And so they both had big parts about being in Dodge City. So I know every mm-hmm. resident, I think it's, it has to be a criteria once you once you're from there, you have to watch those. Yeah. You got to pick one. Which one are you watching? Are you going with Tombstone or Wild Earth? Look, I. Val Kilmer and Tombstone, epic. But, but, Tyler, like Don't Kevin lose. Costner, the 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 wider movie is really the whole story of his life. Tombstone is more narrow, right? The okay, correct. So, I'm going with Wide Earp. It's a elongated story. It's the full life story. So I'm going with Wide Earp. Uh, I'm I'm highly disappointed. I know you're disappointed. Look. And you can't take any – look, Kurt Russell, great, right? Val Kilmer, epic. But I'm more like, okay, tell me the truth. Tell me what the real stuff was around Wider. So the movie Wider. You know, I'm with you on that I, I do agree that yep. like, you know, I get the narrow part. Just, you know, for me, the Doc Holliday, that's who makes the yep. movie. Yep. And, and yep. Val Kilmer killed it. So I, I, I know. I hear, I hear you. All right. Entertainment, so, entertainment value. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Maybe Tombstone. Value. So I love. I'm, it. I'm going. I'm going with the truth. Tell, me, tell me what happened with White Earp. I got you. Both got great you. movies. They, they are. They're. They really. Yeah. I like them both. Actually, I would watch them both. Just White Earp takes a long. It's a long one. So. Yeah. All right. So the other thing that people don't know about Dodge City is the amount of cows that are located in Dodge City. So you know, I'm I'm from Alabama. Okay. So I have to ask the question: Did you ever go cow sitting <laughs> while you were in Dodge City? As, as a juvenile, nothing that you've yeah. done recently, but as a juvenile, yeah. did you go cow sitting? So, so one of the things about Dodge City, and, and when you when you did you drive into Dodge City or did you fly? I drove. You, okay, so you probably did not go this way because if you went to the junior college, you kind of take what's called the bypass. But if you take Highway 50, which is the main highway 
And then when it goes through Dodge City, it goes, it turns into White Earth Boulevard. Okay. And so when you get on the, the eastern side of Dodge City, the scenic overlook. So this will tell you about that. The scenic overlook overlooks about 35 feedlots. Yes. So this, that's, that's the scenic view in Dodge City <laughs> is feedlots. So that'll just tell you all you need to know about Dodge City. And yes, as a youth, I did go cow tipping. That was kind of part of the orientation, if you will, of uh, growing up in Dodge City. A friend of mine actually had a farm. We'd go out there, we'd hunt, we'd stay the night, we'd camp out. And of course, uh, you had to go cow tipping. You have to. It's kind of scary because it's it's dark. These things are massive animals. You try, you know, it's muddy. It's probably got other stuff on the ground that you don't want to step in. That wasn't that wasn't mud, Ross. That wasn't. Mud. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. <laughs> but uh, the scenic overlook in Dodge City is the feedlots, and it's actually. I mean, if you look at it, it's actually kind of because it's just miles and miles of these feedlots. So next time you're on Highway 50 in Dodge City, stop at the scenic overlook. So uh, is this is because I was. When I was, we were talking about all the questions and stuff before the interview, I was I left Dodge and went to Garden, okay, mm -hmm. Garden City, and yep. is that when it's just a two uh, you know a two lane highway, yeah, yeah. cows as far that's, as you can see. That's it's right. Like that's right. Hell glade with sugar cane. It's nothing but that's cows right. as far as you can see. It's crazy. So yep. yeah, it's nuts. All right, another another fact that a lot of people don't know about you, okay, is you played Division Two fullback, starter by the way. At mm -hmm. Emporia State, and you know a lot of people don't know that about you because you played fullback when fullback was actually a position. Okay, so mm -hmm. when you were a fullback, and this is important for our football crowd because you know we're of the age. This, so anybody really that's thirty, I would say anybody uh, thirty-five or younger, this wouldn't even apply to you because you won't have any <laughs> idea what we're talking about. But anybody thirty-five or older, remember it's like two back offenses. What was your favorite? play to block on as a fullback so I, I weighed uh, I weighed 230 pounds really in in college um, wow. and so, I mean I could eat like anything in sight so lifting all the time just you know eating all the time so my really honestly the the favorite play for me blocking wise was just man on man the ISO, ISO. play and our offense was not creative at all I mean, we barely had a counter play where we'd even try to trick him and roll out the other way. But really, honestly, my favorite play was going up the middle. 46 power was to the right. 47 power was to the left. So you had even and odd. And honestly, you just you just went and hit the linebacker. That, that was my favorite play. If you could stick him like right in the right in the sternum and kind of get the, the face of your helmet like right in their chest. That's when you had them. Sometimes if they try to move out of the way, you had to try to cut them or or angle them a certain way. But to me, man on man, just tough on tough, the ISO play. Absolutely. Did you, have, did you have the big neck roll in the back too? Man, I had the cowboy collar. I had the neck roll because I, I had stingers all the time. So oh. I had to keep I had to keep myself as, uh, as stiff as possible. So, oh, yeah, I had all those things. The stinger was kind of the rite of passage for fullbacks back in the day, right? It was. Right. It was. I mean, everybody had them. And then, uh, so the I guess ISO play. You were a really big fan of the charging rule when it came out, I take it, too, right? <laughs> no, not really. But but safety. Safety first. Safety first. I know. It's got to be and, a, a, you know, here, and here's a, the thing. A, um, look, when I played, I mean, I, I remember I remember multiple times basically just blacking out. Like, couldn't see after a play, after a collision. And you didn't go out of the game. You just kind of you wandered your way back to the huddle. You kind of caught your breath a little bit. We didn't – no one ever talked about a concussion. Nobody. It was basically, you got your bell rung. Correct. You had a neck a neck stinger, and that that was about it. You really didn't leave the field, so it was it's a different era for sure. It is a different era. I actually I did not come out of the game one time. I got my I was concussed. I don't remember coming off the field the whole deal. But back then, nobody it wasn't what it is today. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. All right. So being being an Emporia, and I know you know that's that you also claim that. All right. Who's who's the best athlete? Sports figure to ever come out of Emporia. Now this is a close one to me because I'm a big NASCAR guy. Is it Clint Boyer, which yeah. I know everybody there knows? Leon Lett or you, Ross Bueller? Who's who, who's got the who's got the most clout? Definitely not me. That that's uh, that's for sure. Um, funny story about Leon Lett. So I, I missed Leon Lett by it, so it's Leon Lett. Leon Lett by far. I mean that guy was just phenomenal. 
uh, came out of Heinz Junior College in uh, in Mississippi, and uh, I, so I missed him by a year. He was a year older than me, and the legend is is that in pra- they would not let him practice full speed because wow. here's a guy, you know, six six, three hundred pounds, obviously elite, you know, NFL player. They wouldn't let him go against guys weighing, you know, offensive line at that time, 230, 240 pounds. They would not let him go full speed because he would just maul people and hurt people. And uh, so that that was the legend. Uh, there was actually a guy who came after me, a guy named Brian Shea, who set all kinds of Division II rushing records, won the Harlan Hill, yep. which is the Heisman equivalent in Division II. He came after me, and I, I used to say that uh, – Brian Shea broke all my records in one game at Emporia State. So that, that was my, my – my rushing yards were not that great. So I would say Leon Lett and Brian Shea. Okay. Were, all right. Two best guys. I got you. All right. So being a former D2 athlete, and we had Will Hall, man. You were talking about the Harlan Hill. We had Will Hall on last week. Right? Yeah. But I asked him kind of Great the same guy. Question. Great coach. Yep. Yes. So I was, I was asking this. Is, you know, as a former D2 athlete, and now that you're an AD and, and you've been in the FBS, even at, you know, the Sun Belt, the SEC, you know, a few different stops, does it kind of drive you crazy sometimes when the um, FBS athletes complain about how they have it? You know, it, it I, I probably can't say it exactly like that, uh, Tyler, <laughs> right? Um, I can't. No, know. I, can I think, that. yeah, you can. No, I, I, I think you're, you're right. I mean, there, we, we've evolved, just like we were talking about the health and safety. I mean, think yeah. about how safe the game is. Think about all the protocols in place. Think about how far that we've come, unlimited nutrition, unlimited sports psychology, unlimited training, all the gadgets, iPads, video. I mean, just you you name it. Uh, we've come so far. And then you add in cost of attendance. You add in four and five year guaranteed scholarships. You know, now you're going to be able to transfer right away. Now we are, we're going to have name image likeness. We, we've evolved so much. And, and really, everything that we do is about the student athlete. And so I, I think what it shows you, and look, I'm, I'm a part of it. it. It's my fault as well, is we, we've really done a bad job of telling the story about the value of college athletics, of the things that we do provide, because now it's about, well, we're not doing enough. We give away, college athletics gives away $4 billion worth of scholarships every year. Yep. And then people say, well, the NCAA makes a billion dollars on the basketball tournament. Well, for keeping score, four billion versus a billion is a lot more. It is right, and so I think I think we've done a bad job as leaders in college athletics of of really telling the story. Like, look at all the things that we do provide, and so hopefully we get some of these things corrected. Hopefully, it can turn around to say, look, if you come to college, these are the things that we will provide you. And if college is not for you, then maybe there's another avenue. And so I, I think we have to do a better job of telling that story. But, I mean, we had nothing. We had one pair of cleats. We, we could get our ankles taped like twice a week. Um, and one of those was game day, right? I mean, just all, you know, we, we had to pay for our own, you know, meals and, you know, barely had, uh, you know, a, a second pair of cleats that you could wear. You probably had to buy those yourself. You probably had to buy your wristbands and all those other things, you know. So we we've come so far, and and um, and, I, and I just hope we can tell a better story moving forward. All right. So you started. You started. I know you're you're a you know you're a fashion guy, okay? And and <laughs> in your own way, you're a fashion guy. But one thing that you and I have in common is we're huge Cole Haan guys. And I know <laughs> you you have single handedly helped that company grow to like say it because of your your Cole Haan collection. Yeah. All right. So. I didn't know if you knew this, so I was going to make you aware of it, okay? okay. Did you know that Koha, I saw a commercial the other day, they have now started making golf shoes. Have you already, because I bet you have, have you already purchased <laughs> Koha golf shoes? Okay, so Tyler, here, here's the trick. <laughs> I, I have a pair of Kohans on right now. I know you do. I know but here, you. But here, here's the trick. You never buy Kohans when they first come out. Okay. You, you never buy them. You wait on the summer sale. Okay. You wait on the on the fall sale. You wait on the after Christmas sale. You wait on the January sale. That's when you wait, because what if you follow it? And I was a sucker at the beginning, because to your point, I, I love Cole Hans, and I've I don't know how many pairs I've got, 30, 30 some pairs. 
But if you buy them early, you're going to pay full price. Okay. But if you totally wait, dope. if you wait, then everything gets on sale at some point in time. And eventually you can end up paying like half the cost of what the original price was. So to answer your question, I do not have a pair of golf shoes. I'm going to wait as late as possible because the price will continue to come down. Coach me, coach. I'm, I'm, so I, I know so what you need to do uh, is sign up for their email. Okay. Sign up for the Kohan email. You okay. can just go on Kohan website, sign up for the email. You get the alerts. You get the sales. And you'll start seeing the price come down along the way. So don't don't buy them. Don't buy them on the front end. You got me. I'm ready wait. to go. Keep, I love keep them too. I, it broke it broke my heart. Like one of the saddest days in college athletics was when Kohan came off the Nike Elite account. That was the, one of the saddest was, days in the history rough. of college athletics. That's right. All right. So I know I know the other thing I know about you that that everybody loves is your sport coat collection. Okay, so how many, like, I don't know, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen you in a sport coat. I mean, hundreds. I don't know if I've ever seen you in the same one twice. How many sport coats do you have? Do Look, you know? looks, are de- looks are deceiving. Um, <laughs> no, no. I Let's see. So, look, when you transition jobs, right, you go from the, the great colors of blue and red at, at Old Miss, and now I've got to shift to, you know, more maroon and grays and more darker colors here, right? Okay. Um, so I had to I had to sort of divest. And uh, so I gave away some uh, red and blue sport coats uh, as I left Ole Miss to some of my neighbors, some coworkers. I gave away a bunch of ties. Um, so if you ever see like a coach wearing a red and blue tie he, at Ole Miss, he or she, they might have got it from me. Um, <laughs> I think I've got uh, I think I've got about a dozen uh, sport coats. But I can uh, mix and match with different things about a dozen, so it's not as many as you think, Tyler. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm I see, shocked. I see, the, I see the eye roll. I'm, I'm, and the key, I'm the key is you got to mix it up so people think that you have more than what you have, like you, like yourself. So, but I do. I look, a good AD. So I'm wearing a golf shirt right now. A good AD, in case something pops up, has a has at least one or two sport coats in their closet in their office that they can just. Hey, you got called into a meeting with the president. You got called into a donor meeting. You grab that sport code and you can uh, you can go on the fly. So, it's like Clark Kent in the phone. You got your phone booth. You, you got you got to be ready. You got to be I, ready. I like it. I like it. All right. So you don't live in Oxford anymore. So you're not going to offend anybody. Okay. By t- I want to go on record. You're not going to offend anybody because you don't live here anymore. So you can now you can now answer this question. Okay. What is the best place to eat? dinner in oxford mississippi to eat dinner okay you're gonna be real you're gonna be real specific so here here breakfast is too easy breakfast is too easy yeah so lunch is yeah lunch is all over dinner you're going to eat dinner you're coming back to oxford for one night nobody knows you're in town let's throw that in there nobody knows you're in town okay come back at dinner one night you and the wife where are you going we are going to saint leo okay saint leo the atmosphere, the vibe, the the bar area, the the cocktail. They have great cocktails, great wine, diverse menu. If we had one meal, that that's where one we're meal. going. So, what I was gonna do was really answer it: breakfast, lunch, dinner. So that way I could cover for all the bases. So I, I, I know answer. that's so why I, I narrowed you down. I can I, I can cover my guy John Currents with big bad breakfast because you can't yeah, go was, wrong there, like you said. That's a slam dunk. You know what? You can cover. Everything when you talk about Ajax for lunch. That's true. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know that you talk about uh, take, taking a nap after eating that lunch. <laughs> a- yeah, gotta, Ajax gotta and then on the Saint Leo. Day. That's right. So right. Saint Leo for dinner. Great atmosphere. Great vibe. Great. The owners are uh, are are really great friends. So that's where I'd have to pick. Love it. No, Love no it. offense, John Currents, but. <laughs> Love it. All right. So. You know, now that you're, I can ask this question now that you're the AD at Texas A&M, that's awesome. Okay, so one of my favorite things as a kid, I'm talking about as long as I can remember, was watching, you know, your, you know, my, my mom and, and my aunt would all, my Aunt Sandy and my, and my mother, they would leave and go shopping for Christmas. But me, my Uncle Tom, my brother Brett, my dad Ray, we, we, would, we would sit around and watch the Texas, Texas A&M football game on Friday. 
And he said, that was like one of my favorite. Is there any chance that we're ever going to get this Thanksgiving deal back with a new schedule and conferences and all that stuff? I've been, uh, see, I've been the AD since uh, July of 2019 here and at I'm Texas A&M. 70 and million that's the, is that the question? That's the most prevalent question. Um, so, look, I mean, in college athletics, you, you never say never. Uh, but I, I don't see it happening uh, probably within my tenure at, uh, at Texas A&M, however long that lasts. I mean, Texas is scheduled out till like 2034. We're scheduled out till 2030. We play one Power 5 non-conference game a year. So I, I don't see it happening really in the next decade to, to 15 years maybe. Um, our, our hope is that, hey, we're going to be in the playoffs. Maybe they'll be in the playoffs. And we'll meet them uh, in a playoff game. We'll meet them in a big bowl game like the Sugar Bowl because that's a Big 12 SEC matchup. But I, I don't see that being a regular season matchup really anytime soon. A lot of things happen. There's obviously politics. There's local politics. And there's just, you know, I, I think in, in our case, Look, we we've moved on. I mean, you know what the SEC's like. We're we're trying to go against Alabama and LSU and Florida and Auburn and everybody else in the SEC, and we we have really kind of moved on from that rivalry. And it uh, it'll just sit there. It'll keep coming up, but I don't I don't see it happening anytime soon. But you never say never. I tell you, I, I've always said this. If I was, you know, all right, look, if if I'm in any bowl game, like like I was sitting there thinking the other day, like, what if you were like. All right, the Alamo Bowl, all right, whatever, all right. You go dump a gazillion dollars and pay the schools, whatever it is. I mean, you're talking about, I mean, revenue and all oh, that yeah. stuff. That, oh, yeah. Especially in a bowl game in Texas, Cotton Bowl. Something, With, yeah. if it's not yeah. a playoff game, then, yeah. I mean, you go to Cotton when that Bowl. Game, yeah, when, when, that, when that game happens in whatever setting, it, it will be epic. Epic. It'll be, it'll be so hard to get a ticket. I mean, it'll just – yeah, it, it gives me goosebumps talking, thinking about it. But not going to happen regular season. Let's let's focus on postseason. You know what we're going to do? We're going to start the quick recruiting bowl. I'm just going to make one up, and we'll put it. And we're going to yeah. find like a we're going to find a venue halfway between <laughs> Austin and College Station, and we're just going to put it there. There's so, a couple fields out there. A couple That's right. fields. We'll go out in the parking lot and play. Yeah. And, and yeah. Yeah. All right. So, big foodie, I know you are too. So, what was the last thing that you actually cooked for your family? Oh, last thing it would have been on the green egg, steaks, uh, yeah. probably probably fillets on the on the green egg, and that would have been uh, yeah, I guess that would have been Easter. Um, no, I'm, I love the green egg. I love trying new things out. I love the different flavors, smoke flavors. You can I actually found some new charcoal. It's not the green egg charcoal. It's uh, it's like a B and B oak charcoal, and it's actually the smoke flavor is actually better than the green egg charcoal. So. I've uh, I've tried some brisket, uh, some pork shoulder. Obviously, you can't go wrong with fillets, and I and I like to get the temperature way up and sear them yep. really good, and then bring the temperature down and have that nice uh, pink, uh, juicy flavor in the in the middle. So fillet. That was the last thing I cooked for the. My, the only time I cook for the family is on the green egg. Do you Otherwise, do you don't you don't yeah you don't want to see me. I I do pizza. We do chili. We'll smoke uh, tamales on there. We do all kinds of stuff on the green egg, but you're not going to see me in the kitchen like cooking pasta or anything like that. <laughs> green egg or the rest is on, on uh, Sonia. She takes care of the rest. Well, once you say the words, if you're a, a male, okay, and you say the words green egg, that immediately gives you credibility. Like you know what you're doing when you start because the green egg is not as simple as just buying it and stuff and stuff on there. It, it, it takes there's some, it's some there's some time that has that's right. Like, I mean, it's that's right. Serious business. And Our D line coach uh, Terry Price, who used to coach yep. at Ole Miss, he's a big barbecue guy, green egg guy. So he and I are always comparing notes and having fun with it. Yeah, that's good stuff. All right, so the, what's the last song in your car that you sung along to? <laughs> Boy, you're and a good thing it's in my car and no one can see it. <laughs> that, that's 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 for sure. You know, I, I like I like good sort of like soul music, but but more the country flavor. Um, so there there's a song uh, "Where I Find God" by Larry Fleet. Okay. And it just kind of hits you right in the soul. Uh, "Where I Find God" by Larry Fleet. Uh, that was that was the last song, and that would have been uh, 
let's see, today's Wednesday. That would have been on Monday night, heading home from work. Okay. Yep. I, gotta, I have where, not where, I got Yeah, Larry it. Fleet. Great Larry voice. I'm writing that yeah, down. This, Larry this Fleet. song just speaks to you. Where I Find God. That's the last song in the car. And yeah, it doesn't, like, the kids are not going to be in the car. Sonia's not, like, it's just me. <laughs> just me. That's it. Yeah, when I when I do attempt to sing, I get criticized. So I, I my my family yep. that. So, all right. So I know you have you know as part of being the AD, you have been you're on the school plane a ton. Okay, on these small planes. Uh, Tom Allen and I had a good uh, laughing about it a couple of weeks ago about some experiences on small planes. What mm-hmm. what has been the scariest thing or something that was crazy that happened to you on the on a school plane or on a small plane? We were coming back from the College World Series 2014, and Andy Kennedy, Hugh Freeze, myself, Sonia, and we're flying back, and all of a sudden we start smelling smoke. Like, hey, what, what what's going on here? Well, the heater on the plane, apparently Andy Kennedy's, like, knee, like, hit the button, because we had control of it in the seating area, right. like, hit the button on the heater and, like, took the temperature Way, so we're like, it's like 95 degrees, and all of a sudden, this thing starts smoking, and we're like, holy, you know, holy, you know what? Like, <laughs> is the engine on fire? Is the fuselage on fire? Like, what's going on here? And uh, wasn't, wasn't the smoke wasn't that bad, uh, but you could see it. You could smell it. It's hot as can be, and, and the pilot comes back, and he's like, oh, yeah, somebody hit the button here. Just hit the button back, and it'll, it'll cool it back down. <laughs> Uh, so that was a little nerve-wracking for about five minutes. Uh, the scariest time I've ever had, We were coming. I was at Missouri. We're coming back on the team plane from the Holiday Bowl, and we're getting ready to land back in Columbia. And, you know, decent-sized airport. You know, you're on a 747 type, 170 people on the plane, somewhere in there, families, players. And literally the plane's getting ready to land. We're on approach. And all of a sudden there's a wind shear. And it literally took the plane sideways and dumped everything out. All the air masks fall down. People are screaming. People fell out of their seats. I mean, it, it's like a disaster. We thought, that's it. And the pilot got it back up. He circled for about 10 more minutes. And what happened, they had to, actually had to do a study, an FAA study. There was a, like an 80-mile-an-hour wind shear oh. that cut right through the runway. That was that was the most scariest that I've been. It was, I mean, literally the plane is sideways, and people are screaming, and we thought there's no way, there's no way you're gonna make this. And the pilot like pulled it back up, got everybody calmed back down. People were still crying even though we landed, and fire trucks were out there when we landed. I mean, it was it was crazy. Yeah. So that that that's by far, because you're talking about mass number of people. You're talking right. about kids, coaches, yeah. families. I mean. You know, we've all heard those horror stories about Marshall and Wichita State and Oklahoma State, and you're just thinking, man, we uh, we were blessed for sure that day. Yeah, there's been there's you could almost write a book. It's me. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's there. You know, I always I used to mess. So Nick and Preston, the pilots that were here at Ole Miss, they're they're awesome. Right. Uh, they're they're you know best at what they do. But I always used to like, come on guys, like they would, it'd be a, a rocky landing or it would be like yeah. a roller coaster or something something crazy. And they'd give the old, when they landed, they'd give the old, woo, and high yeah, five. Right, I said, can right, you right, wait till we get yeah, off right, the plane right. before you do that? That'd be ridiculous. That's but right. I love it to death. So, all right. So, another thing that a lot of coaches, unless you've coached at Texas A&M, which I've, I've done, I guess, uh, three times now uh, okay. in my career. So, at different stops along the way. So, three different schools, actually. Um, the press box, okay, when the Aggie wore him, Play okay. My first time. Okay, we're at Arkansas State, and <coughs> beat Texas A&M. <coughs> yep, yep, um, at Arkansas yep, State, big yep. win. Um, but anyway, this the press box moved. Mm-hmm. It starts swaying, and so they tried to, to calm us down because I was like, "Look, we're fixing to come out of this thing. What's the is is there any truth? They told us that the press box is on earthquake shock. Is there any? What's the what's no. the deal there?" Is it just no, no, yeah, no, no truth to that. No truth to no that. No truth to that. Um, so, oh. Kyle Field's been rebuilt since that right. time you were here. It was right. rebuilt between 2014 and then another stage in 2015. 
and parts of the old stadium still stand the way they rebuilt it. And actually, it still sways. So the stadium still sways, even though it's technically a brand new stadium. Uh, but there, there's no earthquake shocks. There's none of that stuff. It's just it sways. It's deemed to be safe. Uh, but it, uh, it, it's pretty cool when people, you, people are like, hey, what was that? Oh, that's just the people swaying back and forth during the war hymn. And there's no way that that many people could do that. But sure enough, it's, uh, it's a pretty cool scene. I do have to, on, on behalf of every every coach and player that's ever played at Kyle Field, to Kyle Field over the years, the new renovations is is much appreciated for the visiting yeah. locker room. That's right. Oh, big locker time. room for that was was not. It, it was, was not good. It was definitely top three worst that I've been in. Yeah. But oh yeah. They, uh, much but better. The new, ones, the new ones, perfect. So big time. They do a job of that. All right. So this is you're gonna get a kick out of this. Okay. So we had to ask this question because it's just we have to. Yep. You, you're going to die when I tell you this. Do you have a Brennan Chapman at Texas A&M that you have to worry about what they're tweeting all the time? You know what? We, uh, we really don't. We, <laughs> I think our staff uh, does a pretty good job. It's, uh, I'll, I'll give you one funny moment. During the college football playoff selection, you know, obviously you got to listen to all the banter and all the you know, commentators. And uh, Coach Elko, Coach Elko, great coach he's our defensive coordinator he has a twitter account he'll tweet like once every like six months <laughs> and uh and, and coach elko is just kind of a man of uh not too many words you know great great personality but just sort of keeps an even keel and he tweeted out like i'm never watching espn again you know something like that and i was like okay coach you know <laughs> coach got a little fired up on uh, on twitter so that's uh that's probably the most extreme thing that I that I've seen uh here uh on on Twitter. But otherwise we we don't have anybody that uh, we have to necessarily worry about. So we uh, we we've, we've all had those moments. We've all had our Twitter <laughs> fame, glory, shame, whatever you want to call it. We've we've all been guilty of that. So I I it, love it him happens. To, I love him to death. He's one of my all-time favorites. I love him to death. But I always would mess with him. I was like I would say my he would tweet something and I would go, "Why?" Why? Yeah, right, right. Why? Like, why? Why? Is he? Yeah. I think he just he did it just to get aroused out of me. Sometimes part of it is, yeah. Part of it is you you do that. You do that just to you know people are going to react. You know people are just going to go over the top, and it's like, okay, let's see how foolish people will react if we do this. So I think that was part of Brennan's uh, strategy. Yeah, I remember one time the the funniest thing I think he ever tweeted, ever in the history that he got the most grief about was. Mississippi State was in, I think it was Tallahassee or something. It was in a, uh, a region. It was a regional time, and the, they got beat like twenty-one to three, or no, it was like twenty. I don't know whatever it was. It was a weird score. They got beat bad, and he goes, "I'm sorry, I missed the game in Tallahassee today. Did uh, did I think it was Florida State or whoever it was? Did they miss the uh, extra point or did they extra go for point. two? Oh, I think I, I so, remember that one. Yeah, and yeah. So, yeah. Tom Luke and I were sitting in Tom's Luke in Tom's office, and and Ole Miss had just won the first opening uh, game of the regional at home, and <laughs> Tom goes, "That's it. You just jinxed us. They're gonna go on and win the World Series, and we're gonna get put out we're, by." The, and sure enough, like we and we lost like, a great game, oh, like four seed or whatever it was, and then they go on. I think I don't know if they I don't think they won it, but they went and played for it, whatever it was. But <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, he got. That and banana for lunch. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, all right. So I got I got a good one for you here. So kind of being being an AD is kind of like you're. I mean, you're you get a lot of the same kind of uh, love that coaches get. So every decision that you make, every single one is either is loved by some and it's hate hated by some. Every you know, some people love you, some people hate you. There's always this. You can't make. You're in a position where you can't make everybody happy or ever. And so how, in, as being, I think it's something you've done a great job with, and I'm just curious is how do you, how have you maintained that balance with keeping, you know, fans happy, but also at the same time having to make hard decisions? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it, it's not easy because, right, you, you, as a human being, we all want to please people and we want to make people happy and we want everybody to like us and all that's kind of your human, you know, nature and human instinct, but I, I learned this early on. If you try to please everyone, you'll please no one. 
right? Trying to please everyone will please no one. And so to me, you gather the data, you gather all the information and you say, okay, what, what's best for the program, the institution, a particular sport, a fundraising, you know, whatever the issue is, you just gather the info and you try to make fact-based decisions and don't let the emotion get into it because you really can't. You have to kind of desensitize your, yourself, if you will. And that, that can be callous and mean and cold sometimes, but boy, you get, you get trapped in the emotion of it and you do say, boy, what's everybody going to think about this? Then you'll you'll make the wrong decision. So, sort of that that can't please everyone, and then never never too high, never too low. Look, we had we had great moments at Ole Miss. I mean, unbelievable achievements and all kinds of things. We're sitting on the stage at the Sugar Bowl, confetti, trophy, speeches, you know, MVP, great moments, and I knew about thirty days after that that we were going to get a letter from the NCAA. Yeah. saying, okay, you guys violated these rules, and, and here's the process. And so I could get really, really high with that sugar bowl and really, really low and let it affect you, but it's like, okay, we're going to keep an even keel. We're going to deal with whatever it is. And so that, that that's kind of been the – that probably goes back to the Kansas week. That probably goes back to the fullback. Hey, whatever it is, let's go hit it. Hey, that ISO play, go hit that linebacker. And so that, that's been the sort of the leadership mantra that I've tried to apply in whatever it is. And, and it, eventually you kind of just, you just, you don't wear your emotions. You just make decisions and you, you care what people think, but you don't care. You know what I mean? You kind of have that filter of, I've got to do what's best. And that's and all I, you can do. And, and kind of on that, how hard it like, because I know, I know, trust me, because, you know, you're a coach and, you know, how many times do you just ever want to just tell everybody to kiss your <laughs> rear, you know, when it's you got pushed back yeah. on something for you? Yeah. Because a lot of times what, you know, fans don't understand and what the public doesn't understand is you're sitting here with a lot of information, okay? Right. You know, you know whether it's in football, recruiting, whatever it is, you yeah. have a ton of information. And then you make a decision that, you know, one, you can't say what information you have or whatever it is. but. Yeah. How many times you just want to tell people just to hey you got to trust me on this kiss my rear or you know I won't I'll see the family show <laughs> that's where that's where you need uh, that's where you need an outlet that's where you need to you need that song in the car you need uh, you need somebody that you can kind of bring into your office and kind of vent to and you know maybe yell at them you know Michael Thompson hey Michael come in here you know <laughs> and so you kind of get it out like that so you don't get it out in uh, in public and you you kind of keep that. Uh, that calm demeanor, but you, you have to have outlets. You have to vent, you know, I, I, I love to work out. So part of taking out my frustration could be, you know, working out or, or whatever. So you got to have those outlets for sure. All right. Before we move on to our final two segments here, all right, associate roulette and what my wife wants to know. One yeah. of our associate questions was so good that I want to ask it to make sure that it gets answered. I didn't want you to okay. pick a different associate. Okay. So, my man Clay Carter, you remember Clay? My, yep. Oh yeah. Right hand guy, my man. Yep. He wanted to know, which is a great question. What is the craziest thing that you had to get or had to do to get a booster to donate? Because it's kind of like recruiting. There's things that when you go and you and you go on to, to get money or whatever. What's the, like a, something crazy that's happened? Wow. Uh, I'll uh, a lot of stories about Missouri. I'll, probably the craziest thing is uh, when when I first got to Missouri, we had uh, what they called the beef program and in farmers in the Missouri area would actually take a cow, a cow and they would donate it to the athletic department and that would go to the training table it was called the Mizzou beef program okay and but here here was the trick me and another guy actually had to go pick up the cows at the at the fair at the ranch wherever the cows were and then we had to take them to the slaughterhouse and so the craziest thing was for three years in a row, me and another guy, Laird Veach, he's now the AD at Memphis, University of Memphis. We're like trying to get these cows on this on this truck, slipping and sliding everywhere. Like, what are we doing? Like, we're white collar. Like, we're, you know, we're, we're supposed to be wearing shirt and ties and we're fundraising guys. And, and we're, we're trying to push these cattle to get on. The, and it was a disaster. And then one time we're driving over a bridge uh, going to the slaughterhouse. And Laird's driving, and I mean, this old rickety truck 
and he hits the side of the bridge with the mirror and like scrapes the truck. We almost get in an accident. The cows are sliding all over the place. So that's the craziest sort of like donor, like resource story was donating cows. So after about three years of this, we changed the way the program was run. We're like, look, just give us money, like sell the cow, sell the cow and give us the money where you sold the cow and we'll go buy the beef. Like yeah. it's way too much of a hassle. We'll go buy the pre-cut kind. We'll be yeah, good to go. Exactly. So that, that's the craziest story, Clay. All right. So we have, a, cause I had, that was in associate roulette. So we, we yep. I had to stick that in there cause it was too good in case you missed it. All right. So it's associate roulette. We actually added, because we're growing at a rapid pace here, so we added our eighth associate this week. So this week, you're the first to ever pick through one through eight, okay? So okay. you're only answering two questions. So pick one through eight. Let's go with uh, five. Five. All right, this here we go. That's episode five. We'll go with five. Episode five, we're going five. This comes from my guy, Birch Mason. You remember Birch? All right, so... You know, there's a Sean Payton movie coming out. So when the Ross Bjork movie <laughs> comes out, who is playing Ross Bjork? <laughs> I have no idea. Let's uh, let's go with um, some people say that I look like uh, Jean Claude Van Damme, so he's an actor. Okay. So maybe we go with him. My son, my 14 year old son, actually turned 15 today. He thinks that uh, Sean McVay and I, the head coach of the Rams, this is accurate. That that we look alike. I agree with so that. So maybe maybe if Sean McVay got into acting, another guy is a guy named John Lynch, football guy. This is also we, accurate. We 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 kind of look. That. He's not real. So I'd say John Claude Van Damme, Sean McVay, John Lynch. Okay. Maybe I, one of the maybe one of those three guys could. could I, play I do. The part. I see. I see. I see the McVeigh and I see the Lynch resemblance. Now that you said that, I see that. That's that's good. That's they good. all they all have more hair than me, so we'd have to adapt to that. But hey, I did. Th- th- uh, those are the three options. I gave up on it. I just said the heck with it. I, I got tired of it. couldn't get a haircut during the pandemic, so I I figured out on my own. That's right. All, right. all right, here we go. Question two. Pick a number between one and eight. Five's out of the out of the question. Let's go uh, three. Three. All right. This comes from Austin Turner. This is our, our IT guy here. Okay, so this is a good one because my mother's been all over me about this because she made a special trip to go to one of these. Does Bucky live up to the hype? Absolutely. There is no there is nothing else like it. Actually I was in I was in a Bucky's on Sunday coming back from Dallas and it is unbelievable. Like it is like it's like Walmart, Dollar General, the best gas station, the cleanest restrooms, all into one. The the, the best food, like the, the most efficient, clean it. Like it is unbelievable. So every time we pass a Bucky's since we've been in Texas, we've stopped every every single time. And Bucky is an Aggie, a great great guy. He he loves uh, Aggie sports. Um, so there is no question that Bucky's lives up to the hype. All right, You've so got to stop. They opened up one somewhere in Alabama. I don't even know. Yeah, I think it's down kind of Mobile area, somewhere in there. I, I have no yeah, idea. Somewhere but my down mother there. Yeah. called yeah. me, this was like two weeks ago. She called me, and she was going, her, her and my dad one weekend, like, you know, they're 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 getting up there. They're, I better not say that. My mom's still young. All right, but they, they, they start, you know, they're doing like, you yep. know, traveling around all that. And I was, she was like, well, we're going, it's like two or three hours away. And, and I was like, where are you going? She's like, oh, we're going to Bucky. I said, what is Bucky's? And they go, it's a gas station. I said, you're driving three hours to go visit a gas station. And she goes, yes. 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 And she said it was the greatest thing that she'd ever seen. It's so, it's unbelievable. That's that's new nothing, to me. So nothing else like it. I have, I've never been. Gotta go find one. I gotta go sometime. All right. So last segment, you've been very generous with your time, and this is a and this is a great question. So my wife, Erin, she has a segment. The last she hit gets the last question. Okay. Uh, kind of like kind of like our house. She gets the last word in my house. You know, I, I can start chirping, but she's, she's always my last yep. word. She's the boss. Uh, so what she wants to and my wife to to prep you for this question. My wife was a former gymnast at Auburn University uh, back in the day. So when I was that's how we met when I was on the football team, and she was uh, a gymnast there at Auburn. So this is obviously you probably know where this is going. All right. So she says the state of Texas. 
is known for producing great gymnasts and has numerous of well-known gyms. Women's gymnastics is widely popular and successful in the SEC. As the only Texas school in the SEC, has Texas A&M considered establishing a women's gymnastics team? It's a great question, and she's exactly right. Local gymnast, SEC, I mean, you see the arenas packed on Friday night for SEC gymnastics. Uh, I, I'm not sure who will win the national championship this year, but SEC teams are always in the mix. So they're, they're, she's exactly right. We, we don't have any plans right now, but again, you never say never. You always monitor Title IX. I think we would have the facilities for it. We would have the space. If we would ever add a, a, a women's sport, I think gymnastics would be uh, at the top of the list because it is popular. It is local. There, there is a club team here at Texas A&M. So we're, we're monitoring it, but nothing, nothing immediate in the, in the near term. I learned all kinds. She was getting ready. Like she was really, this is like the most, yeah. the, the most excited she's ever been about asking me questions. So she, yeah. she went all in on, she called it the, the Jimmer net. I didn't know she the gave Jimmer me a whole, new, a whole new term that they, that they have. Wow. She started naming off all of these, you know, yeah. Texas. She says Texas is the place it's to be amazing. in the United States gymnastics. So I know. She was like, tell it's Raw amazing. that they will be national champions in two years after they start. And they were like, okay, <laughs> you're right. So she, Maybe she we'll have to hire her as the coach. She yeah, can see, be the there coach. You go. So here's what we're going to do. You can hire her as the coach, and then we will bring the whole personnel department, and we're just going to be the personnel department for gymnastics. For gymnastics, and, and then we'll just we'll go recruit every gymnast. We'll go we'll go to Romania. We'll go everywhere, and we'll just we'll get everybody, and we'll dominate. You got the plan. We got the we got good, the good question, Aaron. Good question. Yep. Good job. All right, hey, well, Ross, man. I appreciate your time. I know you're busy during the uh, during everything that's going on. We miss you so much. I know I've told appreciate you a thousand it. times, and I just want to say it publicly how much uh, you've done for me in my career. And I miss you and Michael Thompson, two best guys I've ever worked with uh, on that side from an administration side and just everything that uh, that you've done for uh, me and my career. You know, selfishly, I'd like to say thank you. Thank uh, you. And I know you don't get, get that enough from coaches, uh, but, you know, we go way back and there's a lot of stories we probably can't tell. But, uh, you know, I, I just think yeah. that uh, – uh, very, very grateful for everything you've done, and I, I'm uh, Texas A&M got as good as they could get, so I'm I'm excited. For I appreciate it, Tyler. Yeah, thanks for having me on, and uh, best of luck with your company. Keep it I going. I appreciate it. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, brother. All right.